may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! We're on a mission from God. I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby land where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jackwagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are, coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker. Uh, this is the talk show, Hell Hates. And the more you listen, the more you know why. There's a, a list of <clears throat> articles I want to uh, maybe address today. Uh, some pretty interesting things going on in the world. But... I had a little study today, a little, just a little personal Bible study, and I don't think I've ever done this before, so this would be kind of new. You know, when you study prophecy, you, <clears throat> excuse me, I just wolfed down some very quick lunch, and um, so let me, let me cough and hack for a second, hang on. I tried to mute the microphone as much as possible. Uh, but anyway, when you study prophecy, you study things that are going to happen. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, however, says, The thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. And one of the favorite things that I really, really enjoy doing is comparing Old Testament with New Testament or comparing first coming with second coming. So instead of us studying the second coming of Jesus Christ, it, I thought it was interesting studying the first coming of Jesus Christ. So we can call this the first advent or the first coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> get a King James Bible out if you have one. If not, go to purebiblesearch.com, download the free software <clears throat> for Windows, Linux, and Macintosh, and install away. You can even install it on multiple computers. I have multiple computers. Don't even ask me how many computers we have around here at Bethel Church Prophetic Research Ministry, but it's quite a few for just about everything that we do here is on computer. <clears throat> and so, and, and I want to I address something else too concerning that software and how superior it is to other forms of searching through the Bible. I got an email today, and I responded back. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you what the email was and how I responded. And in doing so, this is an advertisement for the software. Now, I'm not advertising it because we get paid for that. We don't get money. The software is free. The lady that donated all of her time and talents to that Donna, the software lady, uh, I cannot, uh, I send her emails every now and then, saying, Donna, I don't think I've thanked you enough. And that software just, it, it saves people's lives. I'm not kidding you. Because it makes people free. When somebody behind a pulpit or on a YouTube camera or on a blog somewhere, if they're going to lie, if they're going to lie about God or about the Bible, I'm telling you, <clears throat> there is a, a, an army of fierce warriors out there who are armed with pure Bible search software that if you try to lie about God or you try to lie about Jesus or lie about what's in the Bible, 
you're going to get caught. You are going to get caught. Because And, I, I, boy, I'm drifting. I got so many things I want to say today. But I, I'm just telling you, if anybody in, in the world is wrong, the Bible corrects them. Um, before today's PMO and Tuesday's PMO, I'm playing a little bit of the video I made last week on questions concerning the flat earth issue. Bible questions. The And by the way, the lady, quote unquote, Diane, responded and she watched the video. She says, thank you. Uh, very appreciative of, you know, of what I said in there. And, and it gave her something to think about. That's all I care about. It's all I ask is that you take the word of God and you just, you ponder it. You think about it and you say, you know what? God's right. And everybody else is a liar and everybody else is wrong. Uh, except for when they agree with God. <clears throat> so, but in that, the clip before the program today, um, she had copied and pasted in her email to me an article from a Flat Earth website. And I did a Google search and I was able to find that particular article. And um, <clears throat> whoever wrote the article, uh, and this, you know, it's a judgment call on my part, but she used King James on part of the article, but a different translation said what she wanted it to say better than the King James did. And I caught that. Because in some of the verses, the King James Bible did not say what the other translations said. And this causes people to, to, to veer off. If you navigate for a living, whether it's a ship, any kind of boat on a river or an ocean or a huge lake like Lake Michigan, or you navigate by air. I have a friend of our ministry that is a commercial pilot and he flies private jets and he flies VIPs all over the place. He called me the other day from Bermuda of all places. And I said, watch flying around that Bermuda area there. But he navigates. And now modern times, they use all of these instruments to help them navigate. And apparently they just punch up certain things and the navigation system will take them right to the location. But if that navigation equipment is off even a little. If you start out being aimed an inch off at the beginning, depending on how far you're going, by the time you get to where you think you should be, you're not there because an inch turns into a mile and it tur eventually turns into a hundred miles. It is very important that if we're going to trust a book that it be right in everything that it says, not just in most things it says. If if these navigators got a set of charts and they had an airport or a or a marine port on that chart and that chart was off can't find the location. If it's going to go to an island somewhere, Bermuda is an island. And if you leave Florida, Miami, and you're flying to Bermuda and your chart is off when you leave Miami, you're not going to find Bermuda. And now you're out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean lost because your map is wrong. And to me, that's how important it is. Because some say all these little differences in the Bible, they're not much. They're not much to start out with. But over time, it gets worse. And so, anyway, I got an email from somebody. And they said, you know, Pastor, we watched your video about the human body. And you said uh, 208 bones in the body. And you said the word temple or temples is 208 times in the King James Bible. However, all of the web or or online 
Bible searches that we went to all listed 191. Well, that's a big difference. Big difference between 208 and 191. Number one, there are not 190. Well, there are 191 bones in the Bible or in the body, but there's more than that. So what I said was these, and I had a theory what was going on. I said these online searches are only giving you the number of verses that the word temple or temples is being used in the Bible. And sure enough, when I pulled up the Pure Bible Search software and did the search, that's how many verses came up was 191. Because most, that, this is why we have our own software. Most of these Bible search programs do not care about giving you an accurate count. They're just going to tell you how many verses there are. And I, I think we deserve to know the right number. So I encouraged him to get the Pure Bible Search software do the word, type in the word temple with an asterisk. So it's going to search for temple or temples. Now, if you yourself do that search, temple or temples, temple with an asterisk, you're going to end up with the number 213. Well, that's um, five more than 208. So am I wrong? No. No. Because what I did was I realized that there were some places in the Bible where it was referring to the side of the head, the temple of the head, not the temple where you worship. When I eliminated those five places where the word temple referred to the side of the head, you end up with 208, and that's the number of bones that are in the human body. So accuracy means something. Pure Bible Search software, download it, Windows, Linux, Mac, free of charge, and uh, enjoy. Matthew chapter 1. We're studying the first coming of Jesus Christ. So let's just, let's just start reading here, and we'll, I'll throw in some commentary as we go along. By the way, I appreciate the mug. Uh... Pastor Michael Hoggard, Ecclesiastes 7.27, Lo, this, behold this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one to find out, oh, what, counting one by one to find out the account. So I appreciate the mug and the coffee. All right, Matthew chapter 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Well, here we go. We're not, we're not going to get too far because you know kind of where I'm going with this. Genesis chapter 5. The first occurrence of the word book in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 5, and it denotes a book of genetics. That's what a generation is. The next generation, my offspring, carry my genetics and my wife's genetics, and then they pass that down to their offspring and so on and so on. And that's what you see in Genesis chapter 5. And the connection here, of course, is in Genesis 5, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female created he them. Not male and female created he him. God's not a male and female, and neither was Adam. And blessed them and called their name Adam, which is why the woman takes the man's name. Right? And called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived... 130 years. And it gives <clears throat> this little story here. And then verse 5, And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. The 930th chapter of the Bible is Matthew chapter 1. It takes you literally comparing the beginning of Genesis 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam compared to Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. And then you see that Adam lived 930 years, and Matthew 1 is the 930th chapter, and we know from studying the Bible that a comparison between Adam and Christ is highly significant because Adam is a proto-Christ. He is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 3, where we have the 
another lineage of Jesus given. Uh, Luke chapter 3 starts out in verse 23, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. You follow that lineage to track it. There's 77 names here from at, or from Jesus all the way back to God. God is the last one mentioned. But it says of Adam in verse 38, Adam, which was the son of God. I like it. Because Adam then is a, a prophetic picture, foreshadowing, typology of Jesus Christ. So Paul says, in, in I think it's in Romans 5, as in Adam, all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So you and I at birth bear the book of the generation of Adam. We have in us every Every base pair of my DNA came from the loins of Adam. So, I am Adam. You are Adam. We are, we be Adam. That in itself means that we are born in sin. We are fashioned in iniquity. Born in as automatic sinners, it's in our genetics. So, you remain in Adam, you will die as Adam. As in Adam, all die. Even so, and even so, in Christ. So, we go back to Matthew 1. In Christ, the book of the generation, singular, of Jesus Christ, you must be it's the reason why we have an Old and a New Testament. You must be born again. You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven born once. Pat Boone sang a song. My, my friend Tim Barons and Al Gross used to play this song all the time on KJSL, the Salt and Light of St. Louis, AM 630, back when they did a program here in St. Louis. And he sang a song called Everybody Dies. And I love that song, and I cannot find it anywhere. But the lyrics go, born, just born, let's see, just born once, die twice. Born twice, just die once. I love that. So the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, now we all have life. And this particular genealogy of Jesus starts with the son of David, the son of Abraham. And it traces the lineage of Christ all the way back to Abraham. It does not go back beyond that. It just goes to Abraham. So it, and to me, it's, I don't know, the, it's interesting that this genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1 starts out in numerical order at Abraham first, then Christ but the one in Luke starts with Christ and goes backwards to Adam. But anyway, verse 2, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas, or Judah, and his brethren. Uh, the interesting thing here is Christ is, even though he's high priest, he is of the line of Judah and not of the tribe of Levi. Paul makes a very clear uh, statement. In Hebrews, when he talks about this, he says, here we have a high priest, and there's nothing in the Old Testament law about a priest coming from Judah. The only priests that were allowed were, had to be from Levi. So where does Christ get off being calling himself a high priest? He was not a high priest after the order of Aaron. He was not a high priest ordained by Moses' law. He was a high priest ordained by Melchizedek. And that's going to come into play here in a little bit, which is why he's from the fourth born son of Jacob and not the third son. Third is three dimensions and applies to this earth. Four is the spiritual dimension, and it's not of this world. It's of heaven. 
So, uh, verse 3, And Judas begat Perez and Zerah of Tamar. Remember, Zerah was, uh, broke the uh, womb first. And his, I think his hand came out of the womb of Tamar first. Um, but then Perez came out. And they called him Perez because the name Perez means breach. And Christ came from the breach instead of the firstborn in this case. Um, and there's, a, I could talk about that for a while, but I won't. Uh, Judas begat Perez and Zerah of Tamar. Do you remember that story? Because here we have uh, Tamar, and then later on we're going to see, um, uh, you know who I'm talking about, Rahab. We're going to see those two women played the harlot. I mean, we don't like to think of grandma as being a street prostitute. But that's what Tamar did. Tamar was angry with Judah anyway. Because Tamar um, had one of the sons of Judah. And he died before he could raise up seed. So... Um, Judah ordered that his second son marry Tamar and raise up seed to his brother, but he refused to do it, and he spilled his seed on the ground, and God killed him for that. And so, if I'm trying to remember, it seems like Judah said, well, I can make more kids for you, and she's going, uh, what do you want me to do, Wait. So she plays a harlot, disguises herself, and goes into Judah himself and raises up seed. And those and there were twin sons in her, Zerah and Perez. Okay? But anyway, it's interesting to me that two women in this line of Jesus Christ were harlot women. One of which we know was saved. And I'll get to that in a minute. Tamar and Perez begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram. And Aram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nason, and Naasan begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab. Rahab. Rechab. That's how you would say it in Hebrew, I guess. And here is, now, my, my little theory is um, that this Rechab fell in love with one of the spies. Can't prove it. But we know that Rahab was saved out of Jericho. Her and her house. Why? Because she believed the two. The two witnesses. One old, one new. She believed them both. And God saved her at the destruction of Jericho. To me, it's a picture of salvation. You believe God's testimonies, both Old and New Testament, and that faith. See, God was saving people by faith all the way back then. Uh, moving right along here. Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been wife of Urias. Solomon begat Reboam, and Reboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa. Asa begat Jehoshaphat, or Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias, and Ozias begat Joatham, and Joatham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekias. And Ezekias begat Manasses, Manasses begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josiah, King Josiah. Now, I have a little note in my old Bible here that Josiah, um, I have under here the number 46. Uh, I can't remember why I wrote that down. It's not that Josiah is the 46th name here because there's only 42 in this lineage. So it'd be interesting to go back and look at the lineage it's possible that Jos King Josiah, the eight-year-old king, was the 46th generation from Adam. 
It'd be interesting. You can count that, actually, because now you have a record here of the lineage of Abraham all the way down. Abraham was the 20th in line from Adam, Isaac 21, um, Jacob 22, and the tribes of Israel 23. Dun, dun, dun. Interesting. Uh, meaning Levi is the 23rd son in the lineage of Adam, and Levi was all about the law, death. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Selathiel, and Selathiel begat Zerubbabel, or Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel begat Abiad, and Abiad begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Zadok, and Zadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliad, and Eliad begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Matthan, and Matthan begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now here's what's interesting. Verse 17 is going to divide up the lineage here. He says, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14. It's an interesting number. Uh, and, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So what we have here is we have Christ, and in verse 17, he's dividing up the lineage, his genealogy, into three different sets. The number three uh, would represent sin, possibly. Um, Christ inheriting all of this sin. I mean, look at these people. Abraham, David, Judah. All of these sinners in the, in the fatherhood of Jesus. He inherited that, but he did not partake of that. So you could see it that way. Or you could see it as even though he is the son of man, he is also the son of God. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead Bodily, which is why there would be three sets for the Father, the Son, or the Word, and the Holy Ghost. But then we have three sets of 14. Now, 14 is an interesting number. I don't have a, a huge understanding of it. But I go to the 14th chapter of the Bible. And I think part of the meaning of the number 14, um, it's possible that it could relate to like divine revelation. Uh, in other words, now that we have the 14, then the 14, then the 14 generations, um, then um, you have the revelation of the Son of God. The mystery now at the birth of Christ, the mystery of God is now revealed. And that is the, the, something the Jews never considered. Even though they had it in their scriptures, they never considered that Messiah would actually be the Son of God. But now he's revealed as such, the Son of Man and the Son of God. But then in Genesis chapter 14, if you look at verse 18, we have the order, we have Melchizedek mentioned. Paul in Hebrews writes about Melchizedek. And there's some that say Melchizedek is, in fact, Christ. I tend, and, and you can see it from the scriptures, I tend to think that Melchizedek was an angel, a high-ranking angel, and there is an angelic order of heavenly priests uh, that the tribe of Levi was modeled after. Let me give you an example. Who was it that was only allowed to carry the Ark of the Covenant? It was the tribe of Levi. And those four Levite priests carrying the Ark on their shoulders are a picture of those four angels that are the chariot 
wheels of the the throne of God. You see it in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 4. You also see in the book of Revelation angels giving attendance to, uh, there's one angel giving attendance to the altar. And he uh, gets a coal from the uh, uh, from the altar and throws it down to the earth and all these things happen. So we know that there are angels who are an, a priesthood attending to the service of God in heaven. The Levite priests are an example and picture of that. This angelic priesthood is named after Melchizedek. Instead of it being the order of Aaron, it is the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is first revealed in Genesis chapter 14. Uh, it says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread. Isn't it sad that nasty cigarettes are named after this? And I'm not hitting the drums button either. It's, I hate cigarettes. I hate them. Salem is shalom, peace. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Uh, and he blessed him. It, to me, this is interesting. Here, this priest of God, this angel of God is here on earth. And he blesses Abraham. Uh, at this time, Abram, not Abraham. He blessed Abram. And... Um, he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And did we see Abra Abram giving tithes of all. Abram, who was a wealthy man, had his servants go out and set out one-tenth one-tenth of his herd of sheep, one-tenth of his herd of cattle, one-tenth of his grain, one-tenth of his gold. Where, where it goes beyond that, I don't know. But Abraham or Abram at this time did not hold anything back. Now, to, there's argument about tithes. Is tithing for the Christian church. And they say, well, we're not told to. Are you told not to? Because you have clear examples, both in the law and before the law. Abram was before Moses. There was no law given that said Abram had to give. Mel Melchizedek did not come to him and say, give me a tenth of everything you have and I'll let you live. This was no shakedown. This was no commandment. You know why Abram did it? Same reason you and I are supposed to. Because he wanted to. Now, if you do it because you have to, that, that takes all the joy out of it. God will bless you. God will love you. But it takes the joy out of it. When you give because you want to, you don't need a thank you. When you give because you have to, you say, why aren't you going to thank me? I give candy to my grandkids, and I don't care if they say thank you or not. My joy comes from giving what I have to bless them, and their eyes light up, and they see the candy I got. Now, my daughters will say, tell Papa thank you. Thank you, Papa. Okay. Sometimes. Sometimes they don't. I don't care. I give it to them anyway, because I love them. But anyway... Um, so you have a revelation. Again, some say that Jesus is Melchizedek. I tend to think that Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek, but he is the high, Jesus is the high priest. So it could be said that you have a sort of a mini revelation of Jesus here in, uh, in Genesis chapter 14. So, you know, without spending a lot of time on this particular number, if you have a better idea of what the number 14 means, if you're watching this on YouTube, write it in the comment section. Tell tell us and the world what you think about the number 14, all right? 
Uh, so anyway, let's move on. Now, in verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. In other words, it was, it was done this way is what that means. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, underline this, before they came together. Before they did. Why is that? Why is that important? Because it's a prophecy. Okay. Uh, let's see here. V I R G. There we go. Uh, Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, as we read down, you're going to see the connection here between that verse and what we just read. It's very important that we know that Jesus came as a result of what the Holy Ghost did and not what Joseph did. Very important that we know that. So, be f the, Matthew writing by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost says, I'm going to make sure that everybody knows that Mary was that virgin. Um, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's do something fun here. If you have your Pure Bible Search software out, uh, type in the phrase Holy Ghost. You should come up with exactly 90 times in the King James Bible. Now, here's what's interesting. How long does a woman carry a child in her womb? For how many months? And every pregnant woman would say, nine months too long. Okay? Nine months. Nine is the number of... For fruit bearing. Turn to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Oh, I love this. Genesis chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful. Be fruit. You got pure by the software out? Type in the phrase, Be fruitful. Nine times. Nine times exactly. Nine times exactly. But then, we're not done. Then, in the rest of Genesis 9, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see, in veiled form, the first coming of Jesus Christ. Let me read it. It's in veiled form. You have to know, this is here a little. You have to know there a little. Oops, sorry. You have to know there a little in order to reveal it. Um, God said, verse 9, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. A covenant. It's a promise. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant. This is the sign. Which I make, but you see, it's all about a sign. That verse in Isaiah 7, behold, I give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Jesus was a sign, a symbol, a token, okay? Uh, verse 13, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth, and it shall come to pass when, not if, when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And every Bible-believing Christian goes outside because somebody says there's a rainbow out here and we go outside and we look at it and sometimes a tear comes to our eye 
because we remember that God loves us so much that he made a promise. And to this day, God's kept that promise. I will never, ever again destroy this earth with water. I'm going to do it with fire next time, but not anymore with water. So he said, when I bring the cloud over the land, study clouds. Study, no, study clouds in the Bible. You can study them atmospherically because I promise you, I don't know much about clouds. But it'd be a good study, wouldn't it? Study how clouds form, what kind of clouds there are, what layers of the atmosphere they're in, how many layers of the atmosphere there are. I don't know, but study clouds in the Bible. Because there's one place where God, the enemy, is going to come in like a cloud over the land. And God said, when that enemy comes, if you'll, like a storm, if you look up, watch and see if you don't see the token of my covenant in that cloud. When Jesus comes, he's coming in the clouds, people. He's coming in the clouds. So, it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I may remember the, the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And what is a rainbow? I mean, it's light. It's the sun's light. And who is the sun in the Bible? It's Christ. He is the sun of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. So here is the sun and it's light shining through the, the water droplets that are in those clouds and those water droplets then take the light like a prism and separates out the bands of light. Because what's interesting to me is that you have all these different colors that when you put them all together, you get white. <laughs> if I were to take that many crayons of those exact colors melt them together I promise you I would not make a white crayon so how that works is beyond me I just know that there's seven of them seven different bands of color that you see in a rainbow that rainbow Look at Ezekiel 1. Look at Ezekiel 1. I was going to talk about all the bad stuff going on in the world, but it just... I'm enjoying this better. Ezekiel 1, um, in verse 26, above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne... As the appearance of a sapphire stone and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. It's because we were created in God's image. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins upward, even from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard the voice of one that's, I guarantee, listen, I guarantee you, if you saw that, you would be on your face in a heartbeat. Because that's God. Turn to uh, Exodus 16. Exodus 16. All, I'm bringing this all back to uh, the first coming of Jesus. Because the first coming of Jesus foreshadows the second coming of Jesus. 
Exodus 16. Exodus 16, write this down in your Bible, 66. Genesis has 50 chapters. Now you're 16 above 50. That makes, this is the 66th chapter of the Bible. Guess what's here? Look at, look at verse, look, oh, wow. Wow. Look at verse four. Then said the Lord unto Moses, behold, I will rain bread, rain, rain, bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. And I may prove that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. You remember what Deuteronomy says? That God's doctrine distills as the rain. And this is the 66th chapter of the Bible. Now look at verse 7. Seven bands of color. Verse 7. And in the morning then ye shall see what? The glory of the Lord. For that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? So look in verse, uh, let's see here, where is it that the, I'm missing it, the glory of the Lord uh, appeared in the cloud, I'm missing it, it's, I know it's in here somewhere, uh, the sixth day, twice as much, but you shall know, in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, um, Yeah, verse 10, it came to pass as Aaron sp spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked to get toward the wilderness. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. A rainbow appeared. The glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. When Jesus comes, he's coming in the clouds. The glory of the Lord is going to appear in the clouds, people. And what are we? According to Hebrews 12, seeing then that we are compassed about with so great cloud of witnesses. Oh. Mm. All right, now back to uh, Matthew. I uh, wasn't done with this Holy Ghost thing. She conceived child of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, that phrase, 90 times exactly. And there are, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 fruits of the Spirit. And that's in the ninth book of the New Testament, Galatians. 9 gifts of the Spirit. 9 fruits of the Spirit. How old was Sarah when she gave birth to her child, of promise. 90 years old. Exactly. Wow. And Sarah is the type of us. Because Sarah and Isaac in her, Isaac is the new man that's hidden in the old man. You see it? That's why God waited 90 years in Sarah to give birth to that child of promise because she represents the old man. You could say she represents the Old Testament. But she represents the old man who's weak and frail and cannot do anything way past her years of childbearing, some would say, never going to happen. Never going to happen. I tend to be that negative person all the time. That's never going to happen. And then God does it. But that's what Sarah is. She's a type of, the, of us who have the old man, but we have the new man inside of us. So the old man is getting older every day and is ready to pass away. But the new man is renewed every single day. All right, back to Mary. 
Verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily, divorce her. Even though they were just espoused. That was a legal, espousement was a legal thing. Uh, even some judges, I learned this from Judge Judy. Judge Judy says, every judge is different, but she said, when an engagement ring is given, it's given by the man to the woman in anticipation of marriage. It is a token of the covenant of marriage. And she says, if the woman backs out of the engagement, she better give that ring back or she'll lose it in Judge Judy's courtroom. That's how she sees it. And Judge Judy Scheindlin is, well, I'll just say she's not very, uh, she's not very gentle. Is she? Maybe that's that Jewish mindset in her, but she sees engagement as a legal covenant, not having necessarily the same force as marriage, but she sees it nonetheless as a legal covenant. And if a woman accepts a ring of engagement and does not follow through with the marriage, she is obligated to give that ring back because that's what it's for. Anyway, so Joseph would have started pr divorce proceedings against her to put her away. But while he thought on these things, verse 20, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of God, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Did Joseph believe God? Oh, yeah. Because if he didn't believe what he heard, he would have divorced her. He would have said, and and rightly so. He would have thought that she went out messing around on him and got herself pregnant. And he's he would go, uh, it ain't my son, and put her away as a harlot. But the Holy Ghost said, no. And I got to do this. The Mormons... The Mormon church back in the 80s produced this cartoon film of what the Mormon church's version of this. It has um, Elohim God going to Mary's house. I'm not kidding you. Knocking on the door. Hey, baby. Going into... Ma that makes me angry. It makes me angry. God did not do that to Mary. She was a virgin. And the Holy Ghost wrote the book of the DNA of Jesus Christ inside her womb. Mm, 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 mm. Verse um, 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You know what the name Jesus means? It means he shall save his people from their sins. That's what it means. It's, it's based on Joshua or Yahshua. The name Joshua, the name Hosea, the name um, Isaiah. They all have, they're all of the same Hebrew root word, which means to save or salvation. So the name Jesus literally means the Savior. He shall save his people from their sins. And it's based upon that Hebrew word for Savior. So the Jews in calling, you know, if you know, if you speak Hebrew and that's your language, you know, let's say that I named my daughter Avalon, which I didn't. The word Avalon literally means apple. So if I named her that same name in English, I would name her Apple. Come here, Apple. Apple, come here. Apple, bring me an, a a a bring me an apple. Or if I said to her sister, hey, Pear, bring Apple to me. Uh, Dad, do you mean my sister or do you want an apple to eat? But anyway, my point is, 
when they called Jesus' name, they were calling him Savior. I love that. I love, because I love it, but the Jews didn't. Now, here's what's interesting to me. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Now, verse 22, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, an interesting point that I thought about years ago, I've and I've never seen any place anywhere, even though, Isaiah 7 said, when the virgin conceives, we're going to call his name Emmanuel. Even though Matthew then brings the second witness about and says, Jesus is the one conceived of the virgin. And we're going to call his name Emmanuel. My thing is, when, anywhere, in the four Gospels and New Testament, is he called that? Not in Matthew, not in Mark, not in Luke, not in John. In other words, after he's born, nobody is calling Jesus Emmanuel. So you might say, well, okay, pastor, what's the, why, why not? Why didn't they call him Emmanuel? I think it's because... That name is being held over for his second coming. You see, because if the Bible said they are going to call his name Emmanuel, then that's exactly what's going to happen. It is going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. And so therein brings this issue of when we see prophecies in the Old Testament and we see in like the four Gospels what looks like a fulfillment of it, it is only a partial fulfillment. Yes, a virgin conceived. Of that we have no doubt. But since his name was never Nobody ever called him Emmanuel. Not Paul, not Peter, not James, not John, not any of the disciples, any of the New Testament writers, nobody in their preaching did they ever refer to him as Emmanuel. I think that that verse, that prophecy is being held to be fulfilled at his second coming. So when you're reading Old Testament prophecies, I think it's wise to understand that even though like in, like in the place where Herod kills all the children and it says that was, you know, fulfilling the prophet Jeremiah who's saying, you know, Rachel's weeping for her children. If you go read that area where that verse is from, you'll see there was all kinds of things that God said was going to happen that never happened. So what does that mean? I think it's reserved for the timing of his second coming. It's been fulfilled in part. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, for now we know in part and see in part and prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away. So his name is Emmanuel. But I think that name is reserved for the second coming because then truly for 1,000 years, God will live among men and men will know him to be God. He'll be worshiped as God and revered as God. His Godhood will never be questioned by anybody except, of course, the Jehovah's Witness. And they'll be doing it while they're screaming in agony. Anyway. Um, and then verse 24, then Joseph being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took him unto his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Did Joseph then, after Mary's time of, 
uh, purification after she gave birth, did Joseph then know his wife, Mary? Yeah. Because the Bible says he knew her not until Jesus 